do we discover a whole new world, virtually unexplored. This two-part series will follow a team of scientists on a unique expedition to the Amazonian rainforest. They are on the hunt to discover some of the weirdest creatures in wildlife. Tiny insects of infinite complexity and curious design. I'm interested in why things look weird and tree hoppers definitely fit the bill. They're some of the weirdest looking insects you'll ever see. It's a mystery. Our Homo sapien ancestors have explored all of the continents since our arrival on Earth some 150,000 years ago. Yet what you are watching is a species greatly unknown that has been highly magnified. This is the land of the mini monsters of the Amazon. The natural world hides many mysteries for most humans, but Dr. Stuart McKamey is not like most humans for he knows about the secret world of Membrosidae. The most bizarre and mysterious animals is a group called tree hoppers, and they've been on the Earth 40 million years at least. Stewart is the world's foremost authority on tree hoppers, a research scientist at the USDA Systematic Entomology Lab in Washington, DC. Science doesn't know an awful lot about tree hoppers. There are only three species in Europe and a couple of hundred in the USA. More importantly, few of them bother mankind. Welcome to the miniature and secret world of Membrosidae, more commonly known as tree hoppers. This alchismy is one of 3,000 identified tree hoppers that are particularly difficult to find. The large majority hide deep beneath the lungs of our planet, in the Amazonian jungle. Filmed for the very first time under the environmental scanning electron microscope, we are able to view them under a new dimension. Hairs look like trees, and cavities look like craters. But just how do these miniature creatures live? What is the use of their superstructure? What role do they play in the ecosystem of the tropical rainforest? To find out, the journey begins in Quito, the capital of Ecuador. Stewart has teamed up with Costa Rican entomologist Carolina Godoy. She is the author of the only field guide on tree hoppers. They have spent the past eight months getting ready for the expedition, and the success of their trip highly depends on preparation. Medicine we got? Headlamps. Headlamps. Umbrella. And umbrella. Finding new species requires an uncomfortable 15-hour drive to the Yusuni National Park, where they are to set up camp. A unique place on Earth classified as a biosphere reserve. Stewart has been joined by Nick Tatarnik, an evolutionary entomologist from Canada, and Patrick Landman, a French specialist photographer. The two of them have the task of exploring the canopy. but they won't be alone. Oil is big business here in Ecuador, and it's competing head-on for scientific access to the region. An estimated one billion barrels of crude oil lie beneath the forest of Yasuni. Like most roads that cut through the rainforest, the scientists take the track that was created for the pipeline. After the first night at camp, Stuart is impatient to exercise his sharp, trained eye. This is great. I'm the first morning, and uh, 
Bosidium, we barely know anything about them, but uh, but boy, I never expected to get so lucky the first time. This is what Stuart is so excited about. Bosidium, a rare solitary tree hopper of striking appearance. Evolution has produced a live piece of contemporary art whose ancestors have lived here for over 40 million years. Their large globular eyes are dominated by various numbers of hairy, inflated bulbs carried on their backs. These bulbs come in a range of sizes and shapes. Like 90% of tree hoppers, Bosidium can only be found in the northern countries of South America, which is why Stuart McKamey and his team chose the Amazon to set up camp. We really are coming looking for the unexpected. So by its very nature, we don't know what we're going to find. And that's the exciting part about it. There's so many different shapes of tree hoppers, literally, that you just have to look for any irregularity in the plant to find them. When it comes to disguise, many tree hoppers are masters of the arts, especially as they spend most of their time sitting still, feeding on plants. In order to survive, evolution has developed various strategies. Strategy of evolution number one, camouflage. This symbomorpha nymph perfectly imitates a green leaf. A solitary tolania is hidden on the left-hand side of this branch. Can you spot it? To appear as another living organism in order to avoid predators is what we call mimicry. With their brownish colors, stegospis look rather similar to a dry leaf. Tree hoppers range in size from 25 millimeters to 2 millimeters, the size of a walnut down to that of a pinhead. These are not tree hoppers spread out upon the top of this leaf, but tiny feces. Imitating them and hiding beneath the leaves is a ridiculously small tree hopper, Bulbonota. Others give the impression that they are ants, or just thorns on the side of a bush. It takes the eye of an expert to find them. There he is. He's, you can see him walking through the, through the leaf, see him? What's that? He's gonna jump. He's in it. No, I can do this. Got him. Well, I found that there's a lot of tree tree hoppers around here. They're just they're really hard to find. You know, you gotta you gotta keep your eyes open. You can't blink, or you're gonna miss them. And I've missed a few already. And they're faster than you think. To escape from Nick or other predators, tree hoppers have two pairs of eyes. Ocella size in the center that do not form images, these simply sense light and dark. On each side are a pair of complex compound eyes. The compound eyes are made up of hundreds of facets, and um, no one really knows if they see multiple images or one, or if their brain processes all those images into one, like our brain processes the images from two eyes into one image. Obviously, their eyesight is good enough when you try and catch them. Right, they're fast. Very it's the very first time the team has viewed their subject of research with such high magnification and details. And it's with the same general this incites them to come up with yeah, new theories. Have another species. Oh, wow, that is. Gorgeous. Those are the city on the top. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, I wonder what, it, what it's mimicking. Yeah. Um, I think it's mimicking fungus. 
Yeah. Or the fungus that attacks ants yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Well, maybe. Uh-huh. Nick is referring to the deadly cordyceps. A fungus that enters insects through their breathing holes, spreading through the body of its victim until it dies. A lot of the tree hoppers are spitting images for this, so it's it's possible and quite probable that at least some of these are mimicking dead, rotting insects, which would be unpalatable. Strategy of evolution number two, mastering the art of camouflage to imitate a dead animal in order to trick predators and survive. Like all insects, tree hoppers have three pairs of articulated legs. They use them to walk with or to jump in order to flee from danger. Once adult, they have two pairs of wings. They cannot travel far with these, but are able to escape within a fraction of a second. Strategy of evolution number three, run for your life. And their wings can take them to the summit of the canopy. Strategy of evolution number four, choose a good home. Stewart believes the same kind of tree hoppers are found at the canopy level as down below. It's more a question of light. Hunting for tree hoppers in the dark undergrowth of the rainforest is far less productive than searching for them in open spaces where there is sunlight. Do you reckon we're gonna climb that? I think that uh, we can climb up using the other trees around. But yeah, because that's about 20, 30 meters. I don't know how high you can throw, but I sure can. Well, you know what? Mm, you go first. That doesn't look as tall from here. Umberto was born into the local Warani tribe. The rainforest is his life, and he is their guide. Oh, wow. oh yeah. Uh, there's a huge, huge wasp nest. No, really? Like a human's height of wasp nest. I guess that's what happens when you're in a rainforest. Things live there. Uh, I don't want to climb that. Mm-hmm. Uh, pika? See? See? Yeah. Damn. I think that's... Oh, look at the size of this. Wow. It's really huge. Huge! How old would it be, this one? There's no way of telling how old this thing is. You know, because it's tropical trees, there's no seasons, uh -huh. so there's no growth rings to count. So, I mean, it could be a few hundred years old. It could be many more hundred years old. So, so, so. you can't say how old would it be? <laughs> older than me, older than you, uh -huh. and really tall. All right, well, let's go climb this. Okay. All right. Does it hold our weight? Yeah, of course, no problem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Except for this. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay. Yeah, some of it. I don't know if I want to trust that. I think I'm going to use ropes. All Membrosidae are exclusively phytophagous. This means they feed entirely on the sap of living plants, rather like a mosquito drinks our blood. Treehopper mouth parts, known as the stylet, bury deep into the flesh of the plant in order to suck out a liquid diet. Strategy of evolution number five, have a good food cupboard. The generosity of the surrounding tropical vegetation gives treehoppers a meal. 
and it's permanently available. Like any good hunter, Carolina knows that the best place to find her game is in their feeding areas. And just like certain of us prefer chocolate or french fries, tree hoppers have their preferences too. And their diet is entirely vegetarian. At the heart of the plant's stem are all the nutrients they need to survive. We don't really know why membracids prefer certain plants. Possibly it's due to the type of nutrients the plants have. We know they nourish themselves with phloem. And in the phloem, they're going to find nitrogen, amino acids, amide, and water that is essential. And part of the liquid they ingest will be eliminated along with sugar, the carbohydrates that they use to nourish themselves. An observant eye will see fluids running through the legs of the stictopelta. said that biology is easy and field biology is never easy. You deal with weather, you deal with unknown factors, really tall trees, poisonous snakes. You know, we, we don't control the environment. We're the little speck in the environment and uh, mm -hmm. we've got to set these traps up. I mean, Stuart will kill us if we don't have a light trap up by the end mm -hmm. of the week. Despite the rain, Stuart is determined to invest every second of his expedition time searching for tree hoppers. Luck doesn't always come to dripping wet explorers. The theory is that uh, that this part of the Amazon has never changed. So when there's been glacial periods, other areas have gone to you know different types of woodland or have the rainforest has receded. But this particular chunk of Amazonia has always stayed rainforest. So it's been rainforest for probably more than two million years. It's one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. It's, it's sort of a wild frontier. We know it exists. People have been going to the rainforest. People have been living in the rainforest for thousands of years. And it looks like this vast homogenous field of trees, you know, that all, it's just all rainforest. But being here, you realize that it's really just, it's a massive diversity. Hoppers have several life stages, and scientists have called this incomplete metamorphosis. From the egg of this alchismy species will hatch a tiny transparent nymph. It takes approximately one hour for the nymph to completely hatch, a delicate moment for the six-legged insect. During the nymph's lifetime, mother will never be far, protecting her offspring from the dangers of the rainforest, 
a rare behavior for insects. This is a freshly hatched first instar. Over the next month, the nymph will go through five molts to reach adulthood. This second instar will molt into third instar. At the fourth instar, females can be clearly distinguished from males. The last instar's abdomen appears fully developed, and as a young adult, the female's colors are attractive in comparison to her mother's. But these Ambonia crassicornis will not be mature enough for reproduction before another three weeks. Just like their parents, the young nymphs come in all different shapes, colors, and sizes. They hardly resemble their parents at this stage, and for many species, scientists do not know which instar will turn into which adult. There are so many insects in the world that despite the number of entomologists that there are, there's too much diversity to cover. And tree hoppers, we're fortunate right now that there are perhaps uh, 20 people, tops, around the world that are studying them. Stewart has identified this nymph as a young heteronotus. And what is rather astonishing is that in just a few weeks, it will eventually turn into this. The adult heteronotus. It has grown an extraordinary pronotum and is ready to leave the group to lead a solitary existence. But most nymphs are gregarious. They are often found clustered together on the same stem, and this group is under the watchful eye of their mother. Nymphs are highly vulnerable. Their pronotum is not fully developed and they have no wings to escape danger. And in their world, this stink bug is a predator. The bug seems impressed by Mother Ambonia. But he's a hungry stink bug and he's on his hunt for food. Mother flaps her wings in warning and her children send out simultaneous alarm signals in despair. Strategy of evolution number six, having a protective mother. A strong kick from her hind legs has saved one of her offspring, but danger is still near. She will have to redeploy her courage and get closer to battle him off the branch. Determined, the stink bug has found another branch, and the colony knows he's back. Mother takes position. but it's too late for this young nymph. The bug runs with his prize to savor his dinner in the quieter leaves of the plant. All life depends on death. Nymphs that survive will enter their final stage, leaving behind them an exoskeleton, rather like an old coat. And this young foliata nymph is leaving her group for a major change. With all her force, the fragile nymph focuses her energy on leaving the exoskeleton. At this stage, she is exceedingly vulnerable. 
but it won't take long for her pronotum to grow and harden. It's a miracle of life. In less than one hour, she has become an adult Boliata. Her pronotum has unfolded to stand proudly above her, and a pair of wings are ready to fly. Oh, nice shot. But oh, you missed no, it. I missed it. Action tree hoppers, let's see. See who's gonna come in tonight. We have high competition from an almost full moon, which is gonna decrease how many bugs come to this. But there should still be some things if our generator stays on. That was the tree hopper, wasn't it? Yeah. By now, there should have been tree hoppers. That's disappointing right now. I, I certainly hope for more. The most curious feature that makes the tree hopper look so wild is undoubtedly its pronotum structure. In other insects, the pronotum remains very simple. But in tree hoppers, it has expanded up and over the body in spectacular ways. There is a brilliant variety of pronotums, but its purpose remains a total mystery. Just what is it for? It's very difficult to understand how some of them formed and, and why. You see that they're very complex animals. They're not just uh, insects in a fancy dress. These images suggest that the pronotum has physiological functions that have evolved over time. The presence of several types of sensorial hair and neurosecretory tissue all support this hypothesis, yet remain to be proved. They don't just have sensory organs just because it's fun. They're there to sense something, but what it is to, they're trying to sense, we don't know. These are not computer-created 3D images, but for the very first time, using a state-of-the-art macro scanner, we are able to penetrate inside the pronotum. Here, we can see that the wall is extremely thin and fragile. There's one species that has a built-in weak point in the pronotum. It's designed to snap off with very little provocation. And the big bulb on top of the body is what the predator is going to get, and the tree hopper can survive fine without it. This Bucidium seems to be doing fine despite the loss of its exotic pronotum sculpture. Strategy of evolution number seven, always surprise your opponent. In the fight for survival, being crafty is just as important as muscle power. Typically when an organism has such a complex appearance, it's not just, just there by chance. There's usually a function, there's usually some sort of benefit that over time has led to the evolution of that structure. Artwork helps me to focus in, so at first I see the big picture, 
and I look closer and closer at finer, finer details, and then you start to see the, you know, it's it's like a perfect little machine. The mechanics of everything, the legs, the feet, the armor. They're they're like, you know, minute little perfect beings that that are impossibly small and but also incredibly detailed and you don't notice that and you don't really appreciate it until you take the time to sit and draw something like this for an hour for two hours hi Patrick oh hello Carolina can I take a look through your lab of course ah, sit down please thank you do you know in the same chat you have a female and male? The female is the bigger. Uh -huh. Sometimes the female and male has pronotum completely different. Mm -hmm. really? yeah, in, that... this, in this case it's the same but the female is a little bit uh -huh. bigger. Is that what uh, we call dimorphism? Exactly. In other words, males may look very dissimilar to females of the same species. In the insect world, the female is often larger than the male. Courtship has been observed in only a few species of tree hoppers. Today is Patrick's lucky day. He has succeeded in collecting a very rare male and female Hypsoprora. You're about to witness, for the very first time, the nuptial ceremony of the Hypsoprora species. In real time, they courted for over 24 hours which is immense compared to their short lifespan of roughly three months. These insects are highly poetical. When you observe them through the camera lens with a high magnification, you cannot see them in this way without a lens. Well, there is something poetic. I ask myself how on earth evolution brought these insects about, because their appearance is so extravagant. There's about six to eight of them, I think they're squirrel monkeys. And they've been browsing through the canopy and feeding as they go. I'm about to spot them first, of course. Shooting. Nope. <laughs> it hit the thing, it went boom. So he missed. Strike one. Once we get up there, we're gonna set up the light trap and we're gonna have a look around and see what there is to see. But first thing first is get the line up and shooting. Oh, fuck. And then get ourselves up there, get a pulley set up, pull up the light trap, pull up 30 meters of power cable, set up a generator, pull up the trap, and maybe by nightfall, we'll be ready to catch some bugs. Nope. 
While Patrick and Nick learn about the laws of gravity, Umberto has his own idea. Umberto's a natural born tree hopper. <laughs> and we're just ground dwellers. The rainforest holds no secrets for Umberto. He is carrying the lead cord for the team. Nick and Patrick have finally succeeded in climbing to the lower branches of one of the taller trees. All the trees, there's so many different species out there, each one potentially harboring its own species of insects and other animals. All right, Patrick, take it up. Perched between two levels of the canopy, Patrick's world looks so small compared to the tremendous, colossal size of the forest. After so much effort, Patrick is worried the bugs won't see the light trap. Yeah, there, get it. Right, whoo! Getting wet out here. Stuart has a great passion for tree hoppers. No food, no sleep, just collecting and collecting. It's now two o'clock in the morning. I'm drenched from head to feet. I've had enough. The team is eager to inspect the light trap set up by Nick and Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. Expectations are kind of low. There's definitely quite a bit of stuff. Oh, there is. Okay, let's find some tree hoppers. There's a lot of beetles that we didn't see at the ground. Despite all their hard work, there's not a single tree hopper. It takes a high dose of modesty to be a scientist. Reality can make even the most elaborate of theories ridiculous. Strategy of evolution number eight, always send troublesome visitors down the wrong path, including entomologists. We know they're out there. It's just a matter of getting them. Stewart is getting impatient. It's three o'clock in the morning. He has been waiting for the wind to die down before using his secret weapon, the fogger. It projects a cloud of pyrethrum insecticide, a smoke that will knock out all invertebrates, causing them to fall into Stuart's elaborate netting structure. It's a technique that we need to use in order to study the the rainforest before it disappears. And some of the species that are here, this data can be used to help conserve the Amazon. I know it may seem cruel, but it's like plucking a grape in a vineyard. Only here, within a month or two, it'll be full of life again. Over 1,000 square feet of rainforest insects will become available for study. 
The coordinates of each net has been carefully mapped out and identified in order to find out who is neighbor with who. If you catch insects without recording the, their, at least their locality, they're not very useful at all. Treehoppers and other insects don't live in a vacuum. They occur in a place at a time because of the other plants and animals around them at different altitudes, different temperatures, and if you collect an insect without recording all that data, you're losing a lot of information. And I ran across another genus here that I'm not even sure what it is. It might be a tribe I have, I've never collected before. So really, this, this definitely works. The water levels have risen overnight, and Stuart must step carefully if he doesn't want to drown his treasure. Insect treasure. The contents of each net is carefully emptied into alcohol and labeled. Mm. What was and, that? And. Oh, okay. Stewart has been granted an export permit by the Ecuadorian government, and his two week expedition will mean months of research back in Washington, D.C. Lots of dirt in this one, but I see bugs too. There, he will sift through all the matter he has collected, dissect certain tree hoppers, and publish his findings. This is the jewel of the expedition. a species that has never been discovered before. Well, this has been a really successful first part of the trip in Yasuni. It's an incredibly diverse area. Um, I think we've gotten about 75 species just in, in the two weeks. And uh, if you think in terms of genera, which are the first level of organizing species, we've gotten about uh, almost a third of all the genera in the Western Hemisphere, which is pretty amazing. And I mean, we're good at what we do, but we're not that good. So what it means is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. In the wild, nothing is taken for granted. On the last day of their mission, a beautiful microscopic piece of action is taking place in some foliage close to the Yasuni research station. A female Ambonia is laying her eggs in a cluster. The eggs are covered in a foamy coating that hardens up once dry. Nobody had ever seen such a beautiful scene in the heart of the Amazon. In roughly one week, the eggs will hatch. The nymphs will drink the sap of existence upon this branch chosen by their mother, who will stand guard over them. This is the way of life in the immensity of the rainforest, from tree to tree, from generation to generation, through layers of time.